Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the script club for The Cordelia Dream written by Marina Carr. I'm Jason, the director of development at Irish Rep, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to another Zoom script club. Hopefully we are approaching the end of our Zoom events and we'll see you in person soon. But for the moment, it's a great July day to be here. Kieran, our producing director is here with me. Kieran, say a few words if you like. Oh, I, I just want us to say how honored we are to have Marina uh, here and how honored we are to be doing her, her show, The Cordelia Dream. Uh, it's, it's been an odd experience for us in that we weren't actually being able to be there in the room as it was being filmed because it was done in Dublin. But, but uh, Marina was able to stop by once or twice, so she'll be able to tell us a little bit about how it all felt and, and, and that. But we're, we're just, uh, we're, we're huge fans of Marina and we're just thrilled you're here. And I'm also joined by Seth Bauer, our Associate Director of Development. So thank you for being here. So Marina, if it's okay, I'll read a very brief bio and then you can add some color to that, that short informational paragraph I have. Marina Carr's plays are produced regularly in Ireland, England, and the US. The Gallery Press, which is what published this piece that we all read today, publishes several of her other works, including Woman and Scarecrow that we did at Irish Rep a few years ago. Many of you may have seen that in our studio theater. Um, Marina has been a writer in residence at the Abbey Theater and Trinity College Dublin, and is a professor or has been a professor at Villanova University as well. And Marina lives in County Kerry with her husband and children. Now, welcome Marina, and perhaps you can add some flavor to that. How has this year been for you? Uh, wonderful, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jason. Um, just a small correction there. Everyone thinks I live in Kerry, but I don't anymore. I live in Dublin anyway. It's just, it's on the, it's on the blurb of some of the play covers. I used to live in Kerry, but I live in Dublin now and uh, visit Kerry. Um, from time to time and spent I've spent a lot of time there this last 18 months because of lockdown so whenever they lifted the lockdown for a few minutes we just tear down the road to Kerry because everything was on zoom so we could be there and um, you said you've been teaching this year yes I've been teaching I'm a associate professor in the school of English at Dublin City University so I teach uh teaching was on Zoom uh, since March 12 months ago and we're hoping we'll be back in person in in September for the new semester. We all hope that indeed. <laughs> so you were saying a moment ago when we were chatting you wrote this play The Cordelia Dream 17 years ago and I would love to take you back to that moment and think about what was happening in your life? What was happening in the world? What was the inspiration for this piece? I believe I read this was a, a Royal Shakespeare Company commission. And so maybe the inspiration was, I've got a contract, I've got to write this. But I'm curious to hear what went into the creation. That's usually the inspiration, Jason. You get a contract <laughs> and you have to deliver. Um, I suppose the fact that I've been having a lot of conversations with the RSC and, you know, visiting Stratford and, and seeing all the, all the Shakespeare's. And I've always loved uh, King Lear. And I've been reading it down the years. And I suppose one of the things that really interested me was that there are very few, there are very few pieces of literature, like novels, plays, poems, that, that deal with that father-daughter relationship. So I'm trying to think, I was trying to think ahead of speaking to you today, what is there? Well, there's King Lear, there's uh, Oedipus at Colonus, basically where Oedipus and his daughter um, Antigone. And then there is, there's, well, there's the whole shadow that hangs over the Aristia, which is Agamemnon and his daughter Iphigenia, who he sacrifices for the wind to change and how that shadow falls over all of the Aristia. And then in terms of contemporary stuff, um, Jane Smiley has a wonderful novel called A Thousand Acres. I don't know if any of you've read it, which deals brilliantly with the, the three 
daughters and the father um, set on a farm um, somewhere in the Midwest. I can't remember exactly where now because it's a long time since I've read it. So, um, and then you have, uh, you have Strindberg's The Father, which is another very interesting take on the father daughter, but that's actually more about the relationship with the wife who's trying to take the daughter away from him. And the daughter is less prominent in it. So there were all these things going through my head. And then of course, I have a father myself. I am a daughter <laughs> and uh, I have daughters. And strangely enough, I didn't know, but at the time I wrote the play, I was actually expecting my first daughter. Um, and I had two, two small sons at the time. And I was trying to write this play, this commission, and my husband said, just go off and do it. So I had 10 days. And uh, I went off to this cottage in Connemara that we rent in the summer. And it was the winter. And wrote in a couple of days and never really went back to it. It was one of those, I suppose, I don't know what you call it, gifts or just one of those things that came very quickly but very much informed by my reading of King Lear and particularly, I think, uh, Lear on the Heath, Act Three. So you do bring in references to King Lear. So I wondered if you sat down with King Lear as you were writing this. Um, I also wanna add two, two administrative notes here. If you have questions for Marina, please type them in the chat and we would love to hear from you. I will be happy to call on you and bring you into the conversation. And a second administrative note, we're joined by Charlotte Moore as well, who I didn't see when we did our introductions. So I see Charlotte's living room or uh, there she is hiding from us in the side of the frame. Um, and Charlotte, you're muted, but we'd love to hear from you too. This is not Charlotte. <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. Hi, so you're, you're muted, Charlotte. I'm having terrible trouble with my computer. So if you'd like, uh, if you if you come back to me, please. Well, we I'm see sorry. you now. Welcome. Hi, Marina. Hi, Charlotte. Lovely to see you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope to see you any minute now. Uh oh, it's coming round. Uh, please go on without me and I'll come back to you later. OK, thank you, Charlotte. I'm so sorry. No problem. So Marina, I, I want to dig in a little bit to the character of Cordelia and thinking about King Lear and his relationship with his daughter. What do you what do you bring from Cordelia? And then when you come back to this play 17 years later, you said you didn't do much editing after you created it. What do you see in it? What what do you learn from it or or what would you change? Oh God, well, there's no point in changing anything. I'd have to write a new play because you know you the play is very much, uh, you know, it, it's it's so much time to to become itself, and then it kind of gets fixed. And if you go if you go at it again, I mean, seventeen years down, if I was to write that now, it would be completely different. So I would probably change everything. Um, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be the play it is. So you know that kind of. Um, I'm a great one for leaving it there, warts and all, I suppose. You know, like that's as far as I got that time. That's the way, that's the way I felt about those characters at that time. Um, and I suppose if you, you know, we all like to think we're getting better and better and we're improving as we go along. Um, I mean, in terms of, of playwriting and understanding of, of, uh, our characters and just our facility and ease with the language. We all hope that as as playwrights that you're, you know, you, that you're growing. Of course, this is not always the case. You can take, you know, one step forward and 10 steps back. And in many ways, it's in the lap of the gods. You can have your craft and you can have your plot and you can have your structure. Um, but if, if uh, um, if the gods or the muse aren't with you, um, it can fall flat in its face. So, um, yeah. So I asked it the way I did because you address this in the text of the play and an artist never, I'm paraphrasing, but an artist never finishes his work. I believe that's the man's opinion. Mm. And the woman says, no, an artist does finish a piece. 
so I ask you specifically, would you change things? Because I wonder if this is a finished piece for you. Oh yeah, no, it's absolutely finished. Yeah, no, and I stand by it and I'm very proud of it. But I mean, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is, um, once a thing is written for me, it's written. I've never gone back and, and rewritten a play that's there and published. But once it's published and it's had its first production, it's kind of there for good, good, bad or indifferent. Um, but the, the idea of, uh, yeah, and I don't know what, where that exact quotation is from. And it was one my father used to quote us children a lot, like an artist never completes or finishes the piece of work, he merely abandons it. And I know what he, I know what he meant when he's saying that, because there is a sense where you could be tinkering with it forever and in your own mind be trying to improve it. But I think, you know, I think an awful lot of emphasis is put on, on, on writers these days to interpret their own work. And I'm not sure that's actually a good thing. You know, I think, um, and maybe Seth can come in here on that. I think it's not, you know, I think it's enough that you write the thing and others can come along and tell you what it means. I couldn't agree more, but the, and I'm just reminded though of Sam Shepard would famously rewrite his plays throughout his whole life until his death, even the last production of Buried Child before he passed away, he continued to rewrite. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, you're not the same person you were when you first wrote Barry Child when you were 36 and your values have changed. And, and, and I, I think there's great value in, in the fact that you wrote this at this time and that it's a snapshot in your perspective as an artist and that 20 years later, you know new things that would maybe contradict your perspective from before, but that shouldn't, you know, that shouldn't interrupt the piece that you made 17 years ago. Yeah, what's the great Oscar Wilde line? Um, I wrote before I knew the meaning of life, and now that I know the meaning of life, I cannot write. Yes. I think there's an awful lot to be said. You know, going back and correcting your work like a school teacher, I think, no, we shouldn't do that. I think there's an element of perfectionism in this too. I'm a, I'm a classical musician, so I am not a writer, I am an interpreter in that life. And there is what the author has given us and it has to be interpreted perfectly. And so for me, I go back and revise and revise and revise until it is perfect. And I, I can't record myself playing because I can't do it to the right level. And I wonder if there's any of that in this, in this work or if you feel you have put something out and it is what it is and you go away from it. Yeah, well, I think there, I mean, there, there is always that sense. And what is, you know, the, these, uh, uh, what do you call them? These people who assess forgeries versus originals. What do you call these art, um, art experts, whatever. And there's a special term for them. And I've, I've read a lot because I'm fascinated by forgery and uh, the original. And one of the things they say is the way you tell a forgery from the original is in the original, there are always flaws. And I find that so interesting. That's inspiring, isn't it? Yeah. And, and just when you, when you say about uh, you're a professional musician, but, but it, it has to be, but it, the music has to come through you and your interpretation. It's, it's, you know, if it's just notes on a manuscript, that's dead. What brings it alive and makes it a piece of art it, is your interpretation of it. So that leads me to a couple of questions that bring us back to the Cordelia dream. First, you saw this production that we've just completed filming and that will come up at Irish Rep next week. You saw it in the works in the theater. How was it working in this strange venue that is a theater but has no audience and you are capturing a piece of theater for film to be broadcast at a theater company in this sort of meta way that we're existing. Very strange and, and kind of wonderful because um, I suppose no more than, than the rest of you theater folk, we're all very hungry for, for that experience. So I had the privilege to see Joe working with Stephen Brennan and Danielle Ryan, and they did a full run through for me about three weeks into rehearsal. 
And that's one of the things I love about it. It was rehearsed as if it was for the stage and then it was filmed and fil filmed not as if it's for the stage, filmed like the actors, the actors worked on it as a stage piece, but then the uh, Joe working with um, Kieran, what's the film guy's name? Nick, 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 Nick right. working with Nick um, to create, as you say, Jason, this hybrid thing, which is neither theater nor film, but somehow a mixture of the two. Um, so I'm very excited to see what it's going to look like. We're, we're invited to a screening in the new theater on Saturday evening, and that'll be my first experience of it. So um, it'll be very, I, was, I went in to see them when they were filming some of it as well. So I saw a couple of shots um, and I saw the set and I saw Nick and Joe working there and Stephen and, and Danielle. And of course, because it's filmed, they were doing this, they were doing a take of just a section of a scene and they did it about nine times. What an interesting they were new way to work. terrified by you being there, Marina, by the way, that's what I heard. <laughs> Not at all. I just felt such an honor because I have much to do about film. Um, and I love film, but um, it, it was just so interesting to, to be there and to watch them at work and just to see, uh, just to see how engaged they were and, and how, um, talk about perfectionism, trying to get it, everything, the lighting, the sound. They drop a word, Stephen and Danielle know what to do it again. So it's take after take. Um, yeah, it was great. That's fantastic. I just love, absolutely love what you said about, about the, um, the flaws in the art. I just, I suddenly for the first time ever feel like a great artist because I have so many flaws. <laughs> <laughs> so do I, if that's the definition, we're all, we're all, um, you know, we're all flawed and, and I think, there's there's an artist in all of us buried somewhere, um, it's it's the the thing is to mine it, isn't it, and try and release release that genie. So I want to come back to music again because this is a play about musicians. This is a play about two composers, and while we don't know their re exact relationship at the start of the play, we we understand that they are both artists, and we learn that they are both composers. And I'm curious, as, as I read the play as a musician, I'm thinking, what is the piece of music? What are we hearing? It's so vital to the experience of this play. And you leave it to the director or the interpreter to think about what does this sound? Yeah, well, you, you leave it to the composer, I suppose. Um, I love working with music. I think music is so profound in the theater. Um, and it's, it's a very difficult thing to get right. Um, but there's some fantastic composers out there. Um, so I haven't heard the music for this um, production yet, but I'm very excited to hear it. Um, because I'm not a composer and I'm not a musician, that's something I had to do on trust. Um, if I was a composer, obviously I'd be writing the music myself, but I, I don't know how to do that. So that's, I suppose that's the wonderful thing about theatre, the, it's the collaborative nature of it, isn't it? Um, you know, that we're all parts of trying to bring one thing together. You have the writer, you have the actors, the director, sound, lighting, stage management, audience. And then everything has to be absolutely right. Everything has to be. All those components, if one of those are off, the whole thing is a mess. So I'm curious, I'm curious in the productions that you have done of this play over the years, or that you have seen, has there been a composer who got it just right for you? Or are they all right in their way? Um, well, I don't think there's any wrong. You know, it could be, could be as romantic or as experimental or as strange the music as you want. Um, I have I have a weakness for, I suppose the the lyric line. Um, I'm not great on contemporary composition, but I'm 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 a bit ignorant on it. Um, I think it needs. 
I think it needs incredibly beautiful music to sustain it. Um, not to drown it, but just to to lift to lift and to give the language a lift and to give sometimes give the atmosphere a color. Um, and because at, at the end of the play, um, what she plays is the, is kind of the music of eternity. So it has to. It must have it must have incredible colors, whatever that music is. I mean, when I think of it, I'd be thinking in terms of, you know, a late quartet from Beethoven or a Mal or Adagio or, you know, Wagner aria. That's what I have in my mind. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then you have to, as you know, when you work collaboratively, collaboratively, you have to allow other people other artists you're working with to go their way. Uh, da David, da David Downs is the composer on this particular version of it. Uh, and he, he's, uh, he's just uh, recently been working on the animated version. He's the orchestrating the animated version of Riverdance. So it's certainly, it's quite a big jump to go into the Cordelia dream from there. Yeah, yeah. I'm very excited to hear his music. As am I. <laughs> Seth, do you want to jump in? Yeah, just I was. I'm just thinking about Cordelia and her relationship with Lear, and it seems like their main conflict is Cordelia doesn't know how to lie, and and Lear is not getting what he needs from her, and she's assumed to be his favorite. Whereas in your play, there's so much toxic anger and passion about music. And talent, and and it's almost like they're at, they're at war with each other about talent. And I haven't seen this relationship before, where like a parent and a child would hate each other because of their talent, or there's sort of something like you're killing me or you're robbing me. Um, can you talk a little bit about that relationship in your play? Well, um, yeah, I suppose I can. Um... I don't know. It's it's kind of a, a forbidden um, topic in many ways. Uh, professional jealousy would be yeah. to come at it that way for a start, and then I suppose competition and rivalry between parents and children. Mm -hmm. Again, that's kind of verboten. <laughs> um, we're not, you know, you know the ideal parent-child relationship is that the child will be better than the parent. That is kind of one of the, one of nature's points about um, having children, is that your children will be better than you um, and will achieve better than you. So the idea of being um, traduced or, or at war with someone who is your guardian and who has your care is, is very, very destructive. Um, and I think it ties in with professional jealousy. Um, and I think it also ties in. I think it's I think it's very, very like Lear and Cordelia. Because there's arrogance in Cordelia, too. Yeah. You know, you know, she refuses to wish her father happy birthday. She wants to make an issue out of his birthday. Basically, this is how much I love you, according to my bond, no more nor less. And he's just dying to hear his favorite child say how much she adores him and she won't give him that. She will not give him that. But then if you look at it from her point of view, he's probably drowning her, you know, and she probably needs, she's a young woman. She needs to make her break. She's got the two suitors there. She needs her bit of freedom. Um, and if, if Lear thinks she's going to be sitting in the corner minding him when he dispenses of all his duties and his land or whatever, he's another thing coming. She wants a life. Um, but then there's that, that extraordinary turnaround where she comes back to him um, in Act 5. Um, and that reconciliation, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, and I think it's Ted Hughes has a wonderful essay about uh, the silencing of Cordelia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and how that allows her father to, it allows that apotheosis in Lear, that magnificent turn around 
and, and heartbreaking death. He's just seen too much. Um, and her death, it's almost like her death is necessary for his. So I was playing around with those ideas, I think, in, in the Cordelia dream. Um, Jason, may I may I say hello uh, to Marina, please? I have deep apologies for my recalcitrant computer here. I'm so sorry of all the ones to 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 miss. I I love Marina. Uh, Marina, did I hear you say before that that now you know the meaning of life and you didn't before? No, I was quoting I was quoting Oscar Wilde. Um, <laughs> Well, I think it's what, it's what exactly what it is. Uh, I wrote before I knew the meaning of life, and now that I know the meaning. Oh, that's of life, right. right. Of all the nerve for you to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know the meaning of life. No. I have to. I was going to say, <laughs> if you figure it out, I'll be the. I want. I want to be the first one you call. I will call you the minute I know. The minute <laughs> I have the goods. <laughs> You look so well, Marina. How is it there? Is it is the, the pandemic lifting or how is it's, it? Well, it's been tropical here the last few days. So we That's don't know what, what I hear. Doing. Yeah, it's glorious. Uh, yeah, the energy is good here, finally. Oh, that's um, lovely. Yeah, people are out and about. And I think three quarters of the country is vaccinated. Um, and they're starting to vaccinate the younger group now. And that's where mainly all the infections are now because they're all hanging out, you know, they need to. Um, and they're not going to end up in hospital. Probably, you know, most of them are not, you know, they'll just yes. get a bit sick yeah. and they'll be fine. Um, so so things are beginning to look up. There's still, there's still caution because of the Delta variant and people are still a bit worried. Are you traveling around any, Marina, any, any uh, hopes that you'll travel to this side of the world any day soon? Well, I was on the Blasket Islands last week, that's as far as I got. <laughs> 20, and do you know what? I felt like I was on the Aegean because I was on the sea. It was a glorious day. The water was green. Onto the Blasket Islands, there's all these ruins. I don't know who any of you have been there before. Oh, you make me very jealous. It was beautiful and we camped there for a night. It was fabulous. The seals swimming, dancing in the waves and... Oh, yeah. Marina, fantastic after such a year where, where, where nobody has ventured yeah. out, nobody has been, you know, no. had much joy of, of where they were for a no. while. Yeah, and no, I'd, I'd love to travel, but this summer, no, I, I think it's still a bit dodgy, you know. So we're being, maybe we're being a bit caught also because the younger children aren't vaccinated and it just leads to all kinds of complications. You don't know, will quarantine arrive? You know, when you put in quarantine and you get back and stuff like that. So you, it's just easier to stay at home. I was saying to Kieran that I'm completely antisocial at this stage. <laughs> I just don't go out, I don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> how, how old are your are your kids your youngest kids so the younger ones are 14 and 17 oh, and then wow. the boys are 21 23 wow yeah, yeah. you you kids are you have a daughter and a son as well don't you? i have a daughter 19 and a son who's 16 and i i just came back from a from a driving trip with uh with the with the two kids in the car the 2500 miles in the car with uh with these adolescents Marina, that's why he looks a little pale. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, wow. wow, that must have been interesting. It was. We're down in North Carolina, so that was that was very oh. interesting too. Yeah. Was, that, was that work or holiday? It was. It was work, <laughs> but yes, it was a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so, so coming back to our our script club here. Um, our, our board member, Colleen Murphy, has found the quote for us. So Oscar Wilde wrote, I wrote when I did not know life. Now that I know life, I have no more to say. Oh, thank you. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I think I think Marina uh, did a better interpretation. I think we should. Yeah, I, I, I like your quote better. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to go with that. You can't, you, can't, you, can't trump, you can't trump Google. But I do think that just... <laughs> 
Colleen, there might be another one about maybe I made that up about the meaning of life as well. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe I just made that up. But anyway, the sense you know what the, the sense of it. Um yeah. M Marina was there. I see Colleen putting on her glasses and I believe she's going to go fast. <laughs> and I believe Colleen did not go to Google. I bet that's in her brain. Okay. Marie, Marina, did did your um did, was your dad still is your dad still with us? And uh, no, he died uh, last year. He died last year. Did he yeah. did he get to see the Cordelia dream? And did he have No, but he, he it? read it. He read it. Yeah, he, he didn't see it. It's never been done in Ireland. This is the first time it's been done in Ireland, Kieran. Oh my god. Oh yeah. My god. Yeah. Um so you know, it was the RSC was uh, in London. Um forget the name of the place oh god the hall where charlie chaplin started in the east end oh so yes uh, i've forgotten the name but that's where it was in in london and it's been translated and done the spaniards love it and the italians love it they keep doing versions of it and before the pandemic they were going to do an italian uh, one in milan but i don't know what's happening with that now they may it may pick up again but oh. um Wilton's Music Hall. Wilton's Music Hall, that's it. That's where it was, yeah. Yeah. So um so it's very it's interesting that it's um that it was rehearsed and filmed in Dublin, but it, of course it won't be seen live in Dublin. I mean it'll be it'll be online. It won't be seen live in this this time around anyway. Maybe they'll bring it back or I don't know if you have any plans, Kieran. Oh, oh, yeah, we've been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions from our audience, Kieran, if I may jump in. Please, absolutely. Um, I'd like to invite Marla Del Collins to ask your question. Marla, if you don't mind unmuting. You need to unmute, Marla. Okay, now, I, now you should hear me, right? Yes. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, Marina, I um, I saw your your wonderful uh, just spellbinding play of a uh, woman in scarecrow um, a while back in in live theater, and it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, it, there's so many nuances, uh, so many levels to it. It really hit home in a in a really strong and hard way, and so I wanted to thank you for that. And, and Kieran did an incredible directing job on that because he brought these different realities up and out of that bed, even though they were coming from her own mind and her own thoughts. And I, I thought it was just a brilliant performance all around. Um, so thank you for that. Um, you know, it's interesting, as I was reading it, um, it actually hit home in a personal way. And I hate to bring up personal, um, uh, examples, but I just can't help doing this because it's so it's so right right on there. Um, I uh, I was a painter, and my father was a painter, and my father's painting was um, uh, well. I think people would probably have called it um, uh, okay, you know, technically, but he didn't have quite the uh, uh, freedom in his own mind to be as creative and spontaneous as perhaps somebody who hadn't been totally trained the way I was. And he wanted desperately to paint um, when he retired. And he didn't, just as this, this man was, uh, you know, reticent to, to continue his creative bent. And, um, uh, and I, I said, why don't you paint? Why don't you paint? He said, well, you and your husband paint better than I do. And I, I don't want to even be bothered with it anymore. And I'm, I'm realizing that that was a real competitive statement from him. And I'm wondering, really, parents do set the pace, don't they? They do set the agenda because they have power. And it seemed to me that this, um, this woman was very much trying to win his approval and his praise just a little bit. Um, and, and here I, I was at the, at the time 50 something and I finally got a, a backhanded uh, praise for my paintings, but it took him that long and he, um, you know, he would give nothing other, other than that one little statement, which was in a way a, a negative positive. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I think parents do have a tremendous amount of power. And, and it was almost as if he um, enjoyed torturing her a little bit in that regard. 
so I, I was just wondering about the characters and what you thought in that sense and how you put them together that way. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a pair of them in it. I think she gives as good as she gets as well, you know? She does She does capitulate at the end, but then he capitulates too. Um, you see, for me, for me, the basis of it is, is that it's it's kind of just love gone a bit, little bit all right. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's a huge love bond there between the father and the daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the the ambition gets in the way of it. Mm. And and I don't know, I don't know about this, but there's something also about, I think, traditionally, the territory of, of creation in the world has has been has been the um, and that's shifting now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's difficult for for some men. As, as it is very difficult for women, I think, to take to take control of that and, and to take the knocks mm -hmm. that go with that as the men take the knocks um, and to take responsibility for what you make. Um, but I do think, um, I think the, the journey of the artist who happens to be a woman has traditionally been very, very difficult. You know, you just look, you just look at the, look at the Brontes, look at George yeah. Eliot, look at their names, for God's sake. They're all pretending to be men. Even J.K. Rowling had a man's name. Do you know, you just think, you just think there is, there is an, there is an imbalance there um, that is, is being um, redressed. I think, I think it's being redressed. Um, but the paradigm the paradigm is still patriarchal, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really a question of how you navigate um, yourself within that paradigm. Um, you know, we all have to live in the world. Um, and it's how it's how you how you continue to to do the work you need to do without torturing yourself and torturing everybody else. That's the way I see it now. And I think that may be uh, the case with man and woman in, in the Cordelia dream. Mm -hmm. That they're trying to, it is, it is that battle. It is that battle between men and women. Mm -hmm. And where, where, where are the lines drawn? And where is blood drawn? And how far can you go before you reach that line? Where, where the love flips over and becomes something else. Um, where they they can no longer relate except um, by you know locking horns, or by one of them actually bailing out. You mean that the man resents the woman um, for her success because she's a woman, or that that would exacerb that that's exacerbating it? Uh, it no, I suppose I think I think in the particular case of the. In, in the Cordelia dream, I think what enrages the man is that she's doing exactly what he does. So there's a sense, there's a feeling in which he thinks that she has stolen his gift. She's appropriating what is his. So you translate that then into, into a wider landscape. And it does become about, I think, um, marking territory and I think women women are encroaching on that territory now but would, would he feel differently if it was a son that was then emulating his probably not no because I think I think his ego in this case is just so massive but I don't think it would matter um uh yeah no I don't think it would matter I think anyone anyone who would encroach in that territory would would be in trouble. But I just think it is, it is, um, it is something I think you can apply to, to the more abstract argument of what's going on between uh, men and women in the arts. Thank you, Marla, for that interesting sure. topic. Um, I, I do want to invite Judy Fryer, if you'd like to ask your question as well. 
And Judy, you'll have to unmute as well. Thank you. Yeah, um, Marina, I had a question. You said you were not a composer or a musician. Why did you have your two characters be composers? Well, because I didn't want them to be writers, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and also, uh, also because um, music is another character in a play. And I think it, it like landscape is. Um, and it just gives it that, it gives it that dramatic lift and weight um, that I felt would be uh, more effective and more, more theatrical and more dramatic. Um, there's nothing worse than two writers talking about writing. <laughs> anyway. Um, and I suppose because I'm not a composer, I felt, oh yeah, I can just, you know, read a few biographies on Mozart and Beethoven and Wagner, et cetera, and I'll, I'll have enough background to, um, to, to deal with that. Um, yeah. And it feels so within reach as, I mean, there are so many musical families. There's so many examples in music history of J.S. Bach and his 14 sons all composing. Mm -hmm. So I, I do have one more question for you that I, that, strikes me as something, thank you, Judy, I'll, I'll let you off the screen here, um, that strikes me as something that comes up in Irish literature and Irish plays frequently, and that is the subject of grappling with ghosts in your past. And that is quite literally what act two of this play is, although we, the audience, don't realize it until just before the end when you introduce the, the ghost that is- oh, Spoiler alert. Uh, apologies, <laughs> I hope you all read it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but I'm curious to hear you talk about grappling with ghosts. Yeah, well, it's it's something that's very easy for us here, I think. Um, the other world, the, you know, the she, the banshee, the banshee, the, um, I don't, I, I think it's it's just in the culture. Um, we've grown up on ghost stories, we've grown up on fairy stories. Um, it's vanishing now, but anyone who's had a country childhood or a rural childhood will know about the Banshee, they'll know about the fairies, they'll know about fairy forts, they'll know about all the pish roads around, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, I didn't know that she was dead until I wrote that line. So, you know, I wasn't planning that. Um, so, but but that that's that's something, and I mean, I mean it's, not, it's not just Irish, uh, it's not just in prevalent in Irish culture. It's 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 huge in other cultures as well. For some reason, it's not huge in American culture, and I don't know why that is. I think we're afraid of our ghosts here. I think really? we don't grapple with them. Oh, Marina, that's an extraordinary thing that you just said. You didn't know she was dead until you you, you wrote that line. That's extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. I, just I wonder if that in there. I love I that. <laughs> <laughs> did you, you go back and reread or did you think this is perfect this fits you know well that's you just yeah yeah so that's grand that'll do there now that makes sense to me um yeah I thought it was great also I suppose also because um you know death in theater really works um and I suppose yeah I love the I love tragedy I love writing tragedy. Um, can I can I ask you a, a, just a just a process question because that didn't I, I was so intrigued by that as well. Are you when when you form the characters or you've created the characters, do you just let them run off with themselves then and see how it works out, uh, or or do you or is it? You, you, obviously, I don't think you plan it from from the get go, where you sit down and write. This is going to happen. That's going to happen, and I'm going to get towards there. What? How do you do it? Yeah, I, I make it up as I go along. I never. I mean, as a younger playwright, I would have had my little schema, but I never really stuck to it. And um, so, when you know, if I'm doing an adaptation or whatever, it's great because all the point, the plot points there that the hard wiring of the thing is there and it's can be quite liberating to have that but it can be quite constraining as well um so yeah i just like to see what happens 
Um, I, I suppose as I get older, I spend a lot more time thinking about the characters. Not even thinking is even wrong, just spacing about them. And then trying not to use up all that spacing time and trying to keep some of it where I'm actually at the desk with the pen and the page and get some of that down. Um, but I, I wrote this play very quickly and I think you can tell that because uh, that it is written very quickly because there's not much plot in it really. It's just two acts and it's two characters and it's just conversations really. Um, so it's quite contained. Sometimes you can, when you're writing and Seth will know about this, you can just, where, where you set the thing will define how the outcome you know, so it's set in it's set in the man's room, and both there's a five year gap between um between each act, and that dictates a hell of a lot. Just just there, just those two things. Um, I think it's I think time is really interesting in writing, and it's something I need to do think about more because I tend to follow that kind of Aristotelian thing that it all happens, you know, it all unfolds straight away but actually if you look at Chekhov or you look at a lot of um Ibsen or you know um you'll see that there are huge gaps of time for example if you look is it uh is it the seagull yeah if you look at the first three acts they take part very quickly and then there's a two-year gap between I think it's act three and act four you know right. where where Nina right. comes back and she had the baby and the baby's died and Two years has passed. Uh, Constantine's become published writer. Um, Arcadine is back with, uh, what's his name? The writer, the other writer. I've forgotten his name. Tregoran, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so time is really interesting. But yeah, but to answer you, Kieran, yeah, there wasn't, I, I kind of, I, I think I write best when I write first and think afterwards rather than <laughs> thinking first and writing afterwards so I was trying to tell my students just write it's a bit like having children like you can't plan a pregnancy if you're going to have a child just have one and then think about it afterwards <laughs> who, who, who <laughs> it's the only it? way mine arrived who was it said said uh, like write drunk edit sober uh, who was it said that Sounds like O'Neill. <laughs> I said that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, writing drunk doesn't really work for me. I mean, I have tried it, but I can never read what I've written in the morning. <laughs> just to, to edit it, it's just like scrawl. <laughs> it's usually very bitter. <laughs> the playwright, the Cuban playwright, Maria Irene Fornes, used to agree completely with you, Marina, and that that you're get out of your head and let these puppets take the strings away from them and let them say what they need to say and then you can edit it later yeah they need room to breathe i felt the same thing when when i read that she was dead i i felt like the play just discovered that in this moment and it was so enriching and fulfilling to me but also deeply sad that even in this ghost meeting they couldn't have a good conversation <laughs> couldn't forgive each other, even like if this was his fantasy in some ways to have this Cordelia moment and it's not going to be, it's it's so deeply dissatisfyingly human that they won't get the closure that they need so much. Yeah, yeah. It's to me that sort of flipped the whole thing on its head and you realize all of this act two is happening within the man's head we assume or or it's a ghost story that I can't comprehend and it's just it becomes surreal, but the whole existence has been real to that moment. And it's just, it, it's so rich, I think. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I, we are at five minutes to three. I, I just want to be conscious of your time, Marina. So I will say thank you for, for spending this time with us. We're delighted that on Tuesday evening, the 27th, we are premiering this production of The Cordelia Dream with Danielle Ryan and Stephen Brennan. Um, Charlotte and Kieran, anything to close with here? I just love that play, Marina. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. <laughs> just and love that play very much. <laughs> Thank you both.
One of these days, Marina, we have to talk about Virginia Woolf, you devil. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> That's another conversation. Yes. Well, we're, 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 it's, it, it is one of the, the you know, the, the silver linings of, of Zoom is that we get to have a chat with you, Marina. And, uh, and it's, it's also wonderful, that, like Stephen Brennan is, uh, is an actor we have admired for decades. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that we were just, it was able to happen because of this, of this circumstance. Yeah. It's awesome. And Danielle is a terrific, terrific actress and a wonderful woman. And, and we're, we're just, anyhow, all the elements. And Joe Byrne, it's our second time out with him this year uh, yeah. after the Allen Islands. So it was, you know, a real nice marriage all around. And everybody had such a good time doing it. Uh, yeah. So it was, we heard nothing but positivity coming from Dublin. So great. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining. A, a specific thank you to the members on this call for helping us through this year, for sustaining us, for enabling us to have these great conversations and produce these great shows. So I'm going to stop our recording.